Ooh, interesting. I'm so evil. I can kick the devil out of hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fear chairwoman Harrell. Philip Vincent Haskins de Lecce was born on the 12th of August 1985 in Woodbury, New Jersey. One of three children, Philip's father was of Italian descent while Philip's mother was of German descent. Philip grew up in a Christian household but it was an unhappy one. Philip's father was a Vietnam veteran who had a drinking problem and Philip's mother also drunk heavily. The pair would fight a lot, her dad hitting her mother with reports of him even hitting her when she was pregnant. Philip claims that she was born into sex and conceived when her father forced himself upon her mother although these details have not been confirmed. Aged three, she would attend behaviour counselling where she was diagnosed with autism and learning disabilities. She attended special education classes where she refused to use the boys' toilets instead always choosing the girls. She was eventually expelled from the school for biting another student and smashing up the classroom. She was then homeschooled for the rest of kindergarten until she was old enough to join the Catholic elementary school. She would attend school with bruises from the beatings that her father had given her but nothing was done about this and a miserable home life would continue for Philip. Her mother had a stroke in 1974 due to side effects from her birth control medication which left her disabled. Her mother and father broke up when she was still young in what turned out to be a very messy divorce. Philip was feminine as a youngster. Instead of action men, she wanted dolls and toy kittens. The kids were living with her dad after the breakup but this ended when her brother Neil claimed that her dad had abused him. The children were taken away and given back to Philip's mother. Her father claims that these allegations were false. As a child she was given a nice new bike for Christmas but sadly couldn't ride it as her balls would get in the way. She also developed a liking for maps and road signs in her youth. Philip's dad would go to court in order to get access to his children. With the help of men's rights activists he was granted visiting rights so he would try to bond with Philip by playing sports. This didn't work as Philip didn't like sports. Her younger brother Neil had learning disabilities and would become too much for her mother to handle. The breaking point being when she attacked Philip's mother while she was in the shower. Neil was then sent to live in a home. On the 4th of July 1997, Philip's dad took her to an Independence Day fireworks display in Philadelphia where in public he pinned her down and forced himself upon her. Her father was arrested for this and taken to court when Philip was just 12. The charges were quickly dismissed by a judge who stated that it was a clear case of manipulation by the mother who had convinced Philip of this in order to create a wedge between her and her father. When she was 15 years old her brother Neil came over to stay on a night visit from the home that he was staying at. He then tried to strangle Philip while she was sleeping so the home visits from Neil became less and less after that point. In the year 2000 she started high school which was a bit of a mixed bag with her being bullied but also bullying weaker kids. At this stage she began to feel more free to express her gender identity and would act more feminine. She even got herself a part-time job at Wawa. In 2002 she was diagnosed with Asperger's and given medication for this but she refused to take it. She had developed a fascination with Latin culture and would dress up like her idol Jennifer Lopez. Not after the best start in life, Philip would find solace in art. This was an outlet for her where she could be in control and not need to confront the chaos that existed away from the page. She began to do drawings that mixed her longing for stability and a love of Latins. She invented her own country named Australatina and would draw the many trials and tribulations that the inhabitants would go through. This country was located off the Atlantic coast of South America and was a place where Latins could feel safe from white people. She was the dictator of this make-believe country. On the whole, her childhood was a lonely, chaotic mess and Philip was a lost soul longing for something better than what was given to her. <laughs> This is ADF Wenselita with another edition of the United Cross, Cross Players Project. Um, you can tell I was getting into that song a little too much. Um, I'm dressed up as Sasuke here tonight because, well, I just felt like whipping my hair back and forth. Um, okay. 
Philip would stay in high school for two extra years before starting college to study computer graphics. Art was still her refuge and anime had become her true passion. So while at college, she helped to found the Anime Club where students could come together and share their love of Japanese animation. While at college, Philip started to make friends. At Anime Club, she would meet a young lady by the name of Corin, who Philip would claim to be dating, although Corin would later dispute this fact. The pair started a comic together set in a high school where the characters would slap each other on the backsides with paddles. Also at Anime Club, she would meet a young man by the name of Dusty. The pair would become friends, with Dusty taking her under his wing, but not all of the people at Anime Club were this nice to her. There was a dark horse at Anime Club. Jody. This young man was disliked by all at the anime club due to him being insulting, harassing women and always talking about his lesbian vampire novel. In 2006, she created an account on the website DeviantArt under the username ADF Fuencelita. The ADF standing for Australatina Defence Forces and the Fuencelita being a place in Spain. On this page, she claimed to be a Hispanic refugee currently living in Canada, both of which were untrue. ADF had come out as bisexual and would wear bondage gear around the campus. Her deviant art page began to get noticed more and more until she had a good amount of followers on the website which would inevitably start to attract trolls. So she set up another page on the site where she could embrace her love of road signs. Around this time ADF would post a triumphant journal about an airstrike that had taken place. The Republic of Australatina had carried out this airstrike as part of their new offensive against Anglestinian white supremacist terror groups in Cis Acadia. She then started to get death threats on deviant art for being bisexual. These turned out to be from her nemesis, Jody, and seemed to be because ADF had been critical about his artwork. As Dusty had assumed the role of protector, he stepped up and reported this to the school administrators and campus security in a bid to get Jody removed. ADF liked this a little too much and started to call Dusty Master and Dom, which made Dusty feel uncomfortable as he just saw ADF as a vulnerable friend in need. At a Thanksgiving dinner, Dusty brought his new boyfriend to meet his anime club friends, to which ADF became jealous and started calling Dusty Dom in front of his new boyfriend. She then started to pay him over-the-top compliments at every opportunity, so Dusty took ADF aside and asked her to stop, to which she dropped to her knees in a suggestive way. Dusty never brought his boyfriend back to Anime Club. ADF had developed a fascination with a female character from the anime Naruto, drawing her all the time, often in a lesbian relationship with her Anime Club friend Corrine. Corrine didn't particularly like this very much and this began to put a strain on the pair's relationship. Naruto was now ADF's main passion with every drawing involving the characters and she would even dress up as members of the anime. In 2007, ADF had a big announcement for the entire Internet. She posted to Deviant Art that she was gay and claimed to be seeing Dusty, who would deny that the pair were anything other than friends. Well, there was one time that Dusty invited her over to play video games, but ADF would keep making unwanted advances on Dusty, who would turn them down each time. In an effort to show that they were just friends, he gave ADF a hug to which she put her hands down his trousers and touched his manhood. She then soiled herself, to which Dusty dragged her to the shower to clean up. I'd just like to point out that I'm not making any of this up. These and what are to come are just the details of the story. Anyway, ADF was suspended from Deviant Art for 30 days when she made fan art involving an underage Naruto character getting it on with his brother and a 50-year-old man. ADF claimed that this was a homophobic attack on her by the website and claimed that the USA is the most homophobic country in the world. Around this time, she came out as gay to her mother by leaving clues around the house, such as leaving handcuffs lying around, dressing up as a girl once a week, and leaving her outwardly gay artwork lying around the house. Just in case this wasn't enough clues for her mother, she wrote her a letter to confirm that she was gay. As her mum was a Christian, ADF was worried that she would be kicked out of the home, but this never happened with her mum being fine with it. The relationship between ADF and Corrine was now reaching breaking point as ADF would keep drawing Corrine's characters. Corrine would request that she stops this repeatedly, but ADF would just continue, so the pair's friendship stopped and Corrine deleted the high school comic. The anime 
Mermaid Club was now in tatters with her two main friends, namely Corrine and Dusty, both at their wits end with ADF. But even in this atmosphere, ADF decided to write a post claiming that her and Dusty had just gone out for a nice dinner, then went back to Dusty's place where Dusty romantically shackled her to a bed and ploughed her like a field. Dusty disputed this, claiming that he was working out of the state at the time. In 2008, she made a piece of art that would change her life forever. The drawing was of a Naruto character shooting Republican presidential nominee John McCain in the face. This picture brought eyes to ADF, but not all of the eyes were good. Encyclopedia Dramatica wrote a page on her, claiming that she could be the next Chris Chan. 4chan would also get in on the act, writing unflattering things things about ADF. In order to reply to this newfound attention, she set up a YouTube channel named ADF Fuencelita TV, but sadly this just fanned the flames more. This newfound stardom would begin to spill over into her real life with trolls contacting Dusty and Corrine via DeviantArt asking for more information on ADF. By now, the pair were not the best of friends with ADF, so they gave the trolls what they wanted, claiming that ADF would scream everything was homophobic if she didn't get what she wanted and the ADF was 100% American and not Latin in any way. Corrine also pointed out that the Mexican accent that ADF did in her YouTube replies was fake. Sadly these videos have been lost to time but they sound pretty funny. Dusty then began to tell the story of when she soiled herself which as you can guess was music to the trolls ears. In an act of defiance ADF posted this drawing mocking 4chan users. With this picture she wrote a post claiming that 4chan users only pick on people that are not white, heterosexual or Christian. Due to the threatening nature of the John McCain drawing, she was expelled from college. It's important to note that ADF has never confirmed that this is why she was expelled, but some people just speculate this. ADF herself claims that she left college due to stress and fear that this could lead to a heart attack. ADF also claimed that law enforcement came to her house because of the drawing. There was now nothing keeping ADF and her mum in New Jersey, so they packed up and moved to Philadelphia. Once in her new home, she began to cosplay more and more as Naruto characters. There was a problem with her cosplay though. She was overweight so she became a vegetarian in order to eat more like her Naruto idols and so that she could fit into her costumes. ADF's politics seemed to get more radical around this time as well. She became what she describes as a gay nationalist and urged gay people to buy guns so that they could defend their rights. She also started to advocate for violence against straight people. ADF had a big announcement for the internet. She was now an atheist having left Christianity behind. She would then start to try and make new friends in Philadelphia by joining a cosplay group named Shrimpy Ninja Otaku Productions, which was mainly made up of 15 year old girls who thought that ADF was a little too handsy with them. Hey everybody, this is uh, ADF Wentz for Lita TV. Um, I'm with my cosplay group, um, Shrimpy Ninja Otaku Pro. You're the shrimpy? Yeah, that's the shrimp right there. And you would have almost went overboard. No, don't kick me. Yes. And I'm here at Sakura Fest with them. My headband goes around the circle. After a short time, ADF left the group due to a disagreement with one of the members. The disagreement being that the legal guardian for the group would not let ADF take photos of the underage children. ADF would say that she was treated like a criminal pedo and that they were blinded by having someone as cool as her in the group. ADF was 23 years old at this stage. ADF was friendless again apart from her deviant art followers who always seemed to encourage her for the most part. ADF had long been against alcohol due to her father's drinking and abuse, but she was getting lonely and longed for a boyfriend. So she attended a gay bar for the first time. She didn't find a boyfriend, but had a nice time, so repeated this. She would then meet a man named John, who was a photographer and offered to take pictures of ADF. The pair hit it off and became friends. She was then attacked by black men shouting slurs at her and throwing rocks. She lamented, and I quote, What is it with blacks and homophobia? 45 to 50 years ago, they had their own civil rights battle. After this, she drew a picture of her winning the fight. ADF had been living with her mother rent-free and also her mum had been buying her expensive cosplay items. So her mother asked ADF to start paying some money towards the household. ADF was working at a convenience store at the time but refused this request so tensions in the household began to rise until one day they came to a head and ADF punched her disabled mother.
ADF's mother getting in the way of her cosplay was more than just annoying, it was a matter of life and death. She had begun to play as the female characters more and more and shortly after punching her mother she had a big announcement for the internet, she was now transgender. In 2009 she came out as both male and female on her deviant art page. She also updated her history as being half Puerto Rican on her father's side and half German Jewish on her mother's side. Her new friend John showed her some adult gay videos. She was shocked by the graphic homosexual acts. After the fight with her mother, ADF wanted to move out of the house but had nowhere to go. She had begun to claim that John was her boyfriend and that he supported her in this move but didn't want her to move in with him so she was forced to continue to live with her mother. In 2010, ADF was mugged by what she described as a large black man. ADF claimed that she won this fight by disarming him and knocking him out. ADF had a big announcement for the internet. She had changed her name to Ahuvia Harel. Ahuvia is Hebrew for loved by God and Harel is Hebrew meaning mountain of God. She also confirmed that she was considering converting to Judaism if she could find a synagogue that would accept her gay lifestyle. Ahuvia was besotted with John and would write long posts about how much she loved him and how much he really respected her. She then came out to her mother as trans which again went well. Ahuvia had a big announcement for the internet. She no longer identified as both genders but now just as female. She realised this one day when cosplaying as a female Naruto character which she stated was her favourite and most important cosplay. Later that year she called in to work saying that she was not going to be in that day as she was planning to end her own life. It's considerate I guess. She then posted to her deviant art complaining that no one from work called to check on her. She was also upset that her mum and boyfriend John didn't call to check she was okay. She claimed to have stood in the kitchen with the largest knife that she had pointed to her chest until one of her cosplay friends spoke to her on the phone for 20 minutes which changed her mind. Sometime later her loving boyfriend John posted a picture of his ex-boyfriend Lee touching himself on John's bed which upset Ahuvia. She was then further upset when John posted that he had MRSA which he had contracted from Lee. Ahuvia was outraged and betrayed by this so she marched over to John's house and left a note under his door which read, I'm coming over to talk to you about Lee and whether or not you want any future relationship with me. I do not tolerate cheaters. John then replied, why would I want to talk to you about Lee? Do you think I want a relationship with him? I don't want to be in a relationship with anyone. I just want to be friends. I always just wanted to be friends with him and you. In case you had not figured it out yet, let me put it to you clearly. Lee and I are dead. We are no more than walking dead waiting to fall over and decay. I do not need any more stress in my life. Ahuvia claimed to her online followers that she and John had been in a relationship for six months and that John had broken up with her as John didn't want to put her through the pain of seeing him die of MRSA. John painted a very different picture, claiming that he was not dying and that the pair had never been in a relationship. Ahuvia then went back to John's house and left another note under his door which read, me or Lee? John, pick one. I will not be played or cheated on. This note was written on the receipt for bagels and cookies. The plot thickened when John replied saying that Lee was not named Lee and that Ahuvia and John had never even slept together. Unsurprisingly, John broke off the friendship. A few days after the breakup, Ahuvia had a big announcement for the internet. She was now a lesbian. Around this time, Ahuvia had been getting more and more into left-wing revolutionary politics, cosplaying as a queer socialist Naruto character. This picture drew more unwanted attention with trolls mocking her online. Ahuvia then began to document her transition with videos and internet posts. Sadly, Ahuvia didn't have health insurance, stating that transgender people find it hard to find health insurance. So she had to find the money to pay for this all herself. Unfortunately, this was not helped when she started to have problems at work. Disputes over her name badge and arguments with co-workers meant that Ahuvia would end up quitting her job, stating that she did this before they fired her. Despite these obstacles, Ahuvia began a program of hormone therapy to help with her transition. She began to attend lesbian marches and was falling into the world of activism. Ahuvia had also found some new anime characters that would take her life in a new direction. This anime was named Italia. Axis powers and her favourite character in this show was named China. There was just one problem, China was a communist. Hey you, is this a better 
water rainbow for you? Uh, I guess the rainbow wasn't big enough. So you want the royal rainbow, not the rainbow I'm looking for. So guess what? I'm going to get you that rainbow because you're such a whiny little <laughs> Of course, Ahuvia would buy the costume for her new favorite character and this became her go-to cosplay outfit. This cosplay was another big turning point for Ahuvia, marking a new passion in life, politics. Not having a job or health insurance was making the expensive transition medication impossible to pay for, so she wrote this post. My transition is causing immense financial strain on my mother's household to the point of food and fuel shortages. The blame does not rest solely on me to what is causing the need to move. My mother and her boyfriend are to blame more. Their inability to ease the economic situation by not being able to combine their separate households by moving in with each other. God forbid you ever pro proposed telling a white heterosexual American male to give up the idea of private property. Ahuvia had a big announcement for the internet. She was now a communist, but not just any communist, she was now a Marxist, a Leninist and a Maoist. In case anyone is unaware of what these ideas mean, we'll just take a brief detour. Chairman Mao, which is where the Maoist part comes from, is considered by most historians as the worst mass killer in history, killing somewhere between 50 and 100 million people. In the Great Leap Forward, he intentionally starved millions just so the Communist Party wouldn't look incompetent to outsiders. And in the Cultural Revolution, he had five red identities and five black identities. The red identities were good communists and the black identities were people such as right wingers and bad influences. The black identities were put into struggle sessions with many being tortured, killed and some even being ritualistically cannibalized. Another one of Ahuvia's communist idols is Joseph Stalin who is considered by most historians as the second worst mass killer in history and Vladimir Lenin which is where the Leninist part comes from oversaw the red terror and started the gulag program in communist russia so needless to say none of these people are good people anyway i thought i'd just give some brief context for the things to come after nine years of no contact with her father ahuvia decided to come out to him with her father being okay with her new lifestyle ahuvia was however seemingly upset with her father's new lifestyle choices he had started a new family with a black woman which ahuvia didn't seem too happy about she started to attend cosplay events for her new love italia axis powers dressed up as the communist character China. But again, she was a little too handsy with the underage cosplayers and was banned from these events. She also started to post videos documenting the changes to her voice due to the hormones she was taking. Hello everyone, this is ADF Wenselita with um, a video. Um, a lot of you have been wondering what I sound like um, in the last few months um, since my last video. Um, well, this is what I sound like right now. Um, it's not quite male and it's not quite female. Hello everyone, this is uh, ADF Wenselita. Um, I was supposed to do a Q&A video tonight, but um, everything's on uh, hold right now because uh, my voice is a little bit of a... There's a frog in my voice and uh, I have a bit of a sore throat and I can't really do the Q&A video unless my voice is 100%. Ahuvia began to fall down the communist rabbit hole more and more, posting anti-capitalist things to her deviant art page. She had also started to go by a new name, Chairwoman Ahuvia Harrell, presumably named after Chairman Mao. In 2011, she changed Australatina into a communist country, giving its flag the addition of hammer and sickle and renaming the country to the People's Republic of Australatina. Although she was now a communist who are famously anti-religious, Ahuvia got an East German uniform for Hanukkah. She then wrote a short story titled Until You Are No More, in which she imprisons and murders her Mao self, proclaiming that now she can be free. Chairwoman Ahuvia was forced to move away from her mother's house when trolls doxed her. She was at this time in a lesbian relationship so had the option of staying at her girlfriend's house but there was a problem. Her girlfriend who had the Facebook name Maria Equality Papo wanted to have kids which was something that Chairwoman Ahuvia did 
didn't want as it made her feel less feminine. Her girlfriend would help her out with money as she no longer worked and the pair would talk about officially converting to Judaism. But sadly, this relationship was set to end after the pair had an argument in a bookstore and chairwoman Ahuvia punched his girlfriend in the face. Chairwoman Ahuvia had a big announcement for the internet. She was now pansexual. She had been staying with friends, but they threw her out, so she became homeless. In an act of desperation, she posted to the internet asking for help and giving out her phone number so that people could contact her. As you can imagine, the trolls that played her used this to harass her more, even recording her voicemail message. Although this is a vehicle cell phone, unable to get to your call right now, please leave a message and state your business. In the end, she did find a housing shelter for the time being, and for her birthday, she got a can of mace and a lock knife, claiming that she needed these for her own protection. Chairwoman Ahuvia then posted, claiming that she had been attacked by what she called hyper heterosexual African Americans. She claimed that they smashed the window of the bus that she was sitting on with a basketball in a transphobic attack. She then made a post about holding misandrist views on cisgender men. Honestly, I've never heard of the word misandrist, but apparently it means the hatred of men and boys. She then went on to blame her father and her mother's boyfriends for these views and admitted that these views went against her views on equality for all. In 2011, she attended the Occupy Philadelphia protest, which was another big turning point in her life. Many of the Occupy protests tried to distance themselves from chairwoman Ahuvia due to her strange costumes and far left views. But for these reasons, many of the people that didn't agree with the Occupy movement zeroed in on her and she became the face they needed to discredit the protests. With her outrageous costumes and communist talking points, she gained a lot of attention online with even Alex Jones getting in on the action. She would be interviewed many times and due to the pushback that she was getting online, she began to walk back some of her more outright communist ideas, instead claiming that she now wanted an 80% socialist, 20% capitalist split. The attention wasn't all bad though and she even led a chance during the protest. More and more people wanted to talk to her which she seemed to enjoy. She was eventually arrested at these protests for blocking the road the watching crowd giving her a hero's cheer. She was in a cell for 12 hours before being released. She claims that she was treated well by the police, but after her release, she went to stay at a Maoist safe house for some reason. While at this house, she posted this video. She went to court for this arrest, but was fully acquitted. Chairwoman Ahuvia was later kicked out of the Occupy Philadelphia movement for unknown reasons. The Occupy movement came and went, but what was left was a new internet star. Chairwoman Ahuvia had a big announcement for the internet. She was no longer Jewish, but now an atheist, seemingly due to the Israel-Palestine conflict with her siding with Palestine. Chairwoman Ahuvia now had a big announcement for the internet. She had fibromyalgia. A little later on in the timeline, she posted on DeviantArt that she was planning on ending herself, to which some of her followers said that they were going to call the police. This changed Chairwoman Ahuvia's mind as she didn't want to get arrested for ending herself. Yep, that's it. As I said before, I'm not making any of this up. She was now a gun owner and claimed to walk the streets with two cans of mace, two Fury tactical knives and a kel 9mm Luger. She then posted a photo of all of her weapons, excluding the gun. A little later, she made a post titled, I'm so glad I left my gun home today. In this post, she details a major clash with... You guessed it, transphobic African-American Mao cis patriarchy members. In this clash, knives and mace were pulled out outside of Starbucks. In response to this incident, she got a telescopic police baton for her birthday, which she started to walk the streets with. On a side note, she stuck this baton up her boyfriend's bum bum. <laughs> We're just going to take a quick break from the timeline to explore some other things about this story that I fancy going into more detail on. Firstly, we'll take a look at some of the trolling that she has gone through. We have already touched upon the 4chan and Encyclopedia Dramatica elements, but in 2013, a K-Farms thread was set up about her which intensified the trolling. These are in no particular order. A photograph was found by trolls and uploaded to the internet of her presenting her bare rear end to the camera with the words, if found, return to the nearest glory hole written on the buttocks. 
The trolls would also follow her around in real life, taking photos of her in the real world. They would also interview people from her past or shop workers in her area who would give out details like she would beg on the street and when people didn't give her money, she would shout and flail her arms around. They also sent her elephant feces in the post. I'm not too sure where you get elephant feces from, but it's a thing that happened. She would get so sick of the trolling that she decided to set up her own K-Farms profile in order to infiltrate the troll network. But sadly, she wasn't very good at being a troll and was soon found out having her account banned. That was until the owner of K-Farms reinstated the account, thinking it would be a good idea to have it live to see where it went. She liked to post photos of herself to her social media accounts at an adult shop named Wicked Grounds. So a K-Farm user named Cat Party decided to claim that she was never abused by her father, which upset chairwoman Ahuvia. So she challenged Cat Party to come and say it to her face, which Cat Cat Party agreed to. The location of Wicked Grounds was set and Cat Party posted a photo of the outside of Wicked Grounds to prove that he was waiting in a black SUV. Sadly, Chairwoman Ahuvia was running late as she was getting a tattoo, a topic that we will look at more later. After three hours, Cat Party left and a short time later, Chairwoman Ahuvia arrived at Wicked Grounds and Cat Party agreed to return. But it would take him a few hours to get back there, so Chairwoman Ahuvia waited and waited and waited until Cat Party finally revealed that he was never there and he had taken the photo of the outside of the shop from Google. Chairwoman Ahuvia claimed that she already knew this and was having a fun time at Wicked Grounds having dinner and buying two impact play toys while waiting. This kind of thing has happened many times with Chairwoman Ahuvia waiting for trolls but them never turning up. That is until one day she was waiting when she reported that someone had just done a drive-by shooting on her. Four to five shots rang out while a white guy screamed screamed die ADF. She reported this to the police who were investigating the matter. This news went around the internet with YouTube videos and many posts being made on the topic. One day, Chairwoman Ahuvia logged onto her K-Farms account and claimed that it was her fake persona that had done the drive-by shooting. She then admitted on Facebook that the whole thing was fake and she had done this to scare the K-Farms users. The owner of K-Farms then made a thread claiming that Chairwoman Ahuvia had passed away to which many videos and posts were made expressing their grief. They also sent her a potato which she didn't like very much using a knife to attack the root vegetable. Over the years this has all gotten a bit much for chairwoman Ahuvia and she has started to sleep with a gun while wearing a black ski mask and has basically turned her home into a fortified armory sleeping in the living room so that she has a clear line of sight to the front door. On the topic of trolling, there is a very unexpected twist to this tale. So Chairwoman Ahuvia was a troll herself. She trolled the world-famous Christian Western Chandler. The story of Chairwoman Ahuvia and Chris starts with some tweets. She then drew a picture of one of Chris's jets in the hopes of upsetting him. She had redrawn it as an Israeli jet as Chris was anti-Semitic. She also redrew some of his other artwork in the hopes of upsetting him. She claimed that this was fine to do as Chris was homophobic and the most sexist man in America. These moments just passed by without Chris ever noticing as really they were just a drop in the ocean from the amount of trolling that he would get. This all changed though with a troll named Jack Thaddeus. Jack would trick Chris into doing weird things like humping his PlayStation while talking about how small his balls were. The trolls then tricked Chris into thinking that Chairwoman Ahuvia was in fact Jack Thaddeus. She wasn't. They gave Chris Chairwoman Ahuvia's details and a photo saying that they should get her to apologise or release her details to the world, so Chris made a video asking for an apology. Chris also mocked her shaving skills, claiming that Chairwoman Ahuvia didn't shave herself very well, but Chris took the time to shave himself properly. He then showed his silky smooth shaved arms and legs to the camera. Chairwoman Ahuvia made a post about this titled, No Chris, I am not making a video apologising to your white, privileged, materialistic, fat Chris was not happy with the lack of video reply so he made another video where he showed a little more of the photo, threatening to release the whole thing unless he got what he wanted. Chairwoman Ahuvia then did make a video reply to Chris in which she seems pretty kind hearted, urging Chris to become happy with who he is as she had become happy with who she was. Later that same day she made another video in which she was less nice, mocking Chris and the town that he lives in. Chris then replied, shocked that she had shown her face and claimed that 
that he was happy being straight. Chairwoman Ahuvia then replied, showing Chris a road sign with the LGBT flag on it. Hey Chris, have a look at this. You're gonna hate me. Welcome to Philadelphia, where it's okay to be queer. Shortly after this, Chris's dad sadly passed away. Chairwoman Ahuvia then decided to make a video for Chris where she walked around a graveyard telling Chris that he needs to sort out his autism, his mother will soon die as she is overweight, comparing her to a Snorlax, and then she tried to recruit him to be a communist, leaving his greedy capitalist ways behind him. On a side note, a lot of her videos have communist music in the background, and in an ironic twist of fate, a lot of them are copyrighted for this. This video backfired and stepped up the trolling of Chairwoman Ahuvia instead of Chris. The last thing of note on this topic is that trolls convinced Chris that Australatina was a real place and he started to include this into his artwork. So, back to the story, at this stage she was seeing a 16 year old boy named Michael. The pair had met online and after some time he came to Philadelphia and moved into a squat with Chairwoman Ahuvia. In case you're interested, Chairwoman Ahuvia was the bottom in the relationship. She stood in the 2012 elections representing the Transgender Communist Party. She didn't win. Chairwoman Ahuvia and Michael then moved to Portland to escape what she called the intolerant transgender community in Philadelphia. She also wanted to be further away from her father. Her young boyfriend was a Satanist and the pair planned to one day have a satanic wedding which I was unaware even existed to be honest. Michael would later reveal details about their relationship, such as Michael having to stop her cutting her winky off at least once a week, not a sentence you say very often. He also had to rush her to a hospital after she took one oxycotton but was unable to handle it. At this stage, Chairwoman Ahuvia's misandry ran very deep. So deep that she would refuse to be served by men in a shop, instead waiting for a woman to become available. Chairwoman Ahuvia and Michael had moved to Portland without arranging any housing so were homeless. They could have stayed at a homeless shelter but refused to due to fears of transphobia so the pair began to live under a bridge. The trolls found out about this and began to nickname her Bridge Troll. Chairwoman Ahuvia had a big announcement for the internet. She now had multiple personality disorder. She had two people living in her body, the Ahuvia Harrell that we've all come to know and love, plus Amaterasu Kamiyama. She calls her other personalities headmates. Just so we are all keeping track, Amaterasu is genderless while Ahuvia is female. In 2012, she posted that someone had tried to indecently assault her. She never revealed who this was, but did write that she reported this to the police. I'm unsure if a lot of of the events from this point forward happens to Amaterasu or Ahuvia, so I will just be using the name Amaterasu unless I know that it happened to Ahuvia. Sadly, Amaterasu and Michael broke up, so we never got to see what a satanic wedding looks like. Later in 2012, Amaterasu claimed that she was attacked by guards outside the Red and Black Cafe in Portland. A member of the Portland Occupier movement investigated this and found that there were no guards working at the time of the attack. Amaterasu then posted a photo of herself with a black eye claiming that the attack was retribution for her actions at Occupy Philadelphia and that Amaterasu had gassed one of her attackers. The story then changed again with it now being four cisgender men who attacked her. These men were part of the Portland Occupy movement and had attacked her for calling them out on transphobia. At this stage, Ahuvia had given up drinking and taking drugs. But unfortunately, Amaterasu was a right party animal, binging all the time, which was just making life harder for Ahuvia. Amaterasu had a big announcement for the internet. She was now a Buddhist, stating that all other religions were infested with capitalism. In May 2013, she made a post with the title title, All My Heroes, Good Cops, Happy May Day. This post read as follows, Happy International Workers Day to everyone with a serious heart to resist capitalism. I'll be in black, sticking my neck out against the system, screaming, 
sobriety to the cops in the car and the cis men in their suits. Molotov cocktails in the air, police cars get flipped, Starbucks, Nike Town and bank windows and ATMs get smashed to shreds here in Portland. Solidarity forever. After this pleasant sounding protest, she went on a nice little outing with her friends camping. While there, she was accused of murdering her ex-boyfriend, Michael. He was also on the group trip and had gone missing with the other members of the group thinking that Amaterasu must have done him in due to her aggressive personality and troubled relationship with Michael. The police arrived and questioned everyone. Then Michael came back to the camp. He had just wandered off to sit by the river and avoid Amaterasu. Understandable, really. She had now fully embraced Buddhism and went to attend a temple, but was kicked out when she tried to use the female toilets. The next thing of note is a post where she claimed that a group of pissed off cis dude bros wanted to her but the police stopped them. She thanked the police for saving her life. In this post she claimed that Ahuvia didn't call the police but Amaterasu did. From what I can make out Ahuvia is the hardcore revolutionary and Amaterasu is a bit more chilled. I think. Tired of Portland, she decided to move to Oakland, California, where she was homeless again. Although she had a bad experience at the Buddhist temple, she didn't let that discourage her from the enlightened path and drew a picture of Buddha stating that he was trans and answered to the pronouns she, her. Amaterasu then had a Buddhist affirmation ceremony at the Buddhist Church of Oakland. Amaterasu was still sporadically taking her hormone replacement medication but was having a hard time affording the surgery she required so she put up a GoFundMe asking for $20,000 so that she could have laser hair removal and bottom surgery. She reached $125 and wrote a post reading, I am a girl. I deserve better than this. No one will hire me for a job because I am a transgender person with intellectual disabilities and a history of incarceration and Sex work is not an option given being brutally sexually assaulted aged 11 by my father for my perceived gender identity and sexual orientation so none of this get a job or bootstrap bullshit. This seemed to have worked with her new total being $235. Some people online then began to tell her to get a job, to which she called them ableist and listed her disabilities. She then posted about being indecently assaulted by a cisgender woman while visiting San Francisco. Amaterasu had began posting more and more about the need to use violence to enact change and brought herself a taser. While in San Francisco, she stayed at a woman's shelter but was kicked out when they missed gendered her and she became aggressive. She then doxed one of the workers at the shelter claiming that the worker had abducted a Hoovia. This was written on Amaterasu's Facebook page. She also got into puppy play, why not I guess? The fact I even know what this means makes me sad. On the whole, she didn't really seem to have a good time in San Francisco, really. She claimed that she was tear-gassed at a protest and planned to leave the state because it is, and I quote, a gentrifying, third-world, racist, classist, infrastructure-deficient, ableist, Hole. She would return to Portland to be homeless again, which was only made worse by trolls contacting everyone that she tried to live with to inform them of her misdoings. Amaterasu didn't have a much better time in Portland, really, claiming that she was indecently assaulted on the porch of the Red and Black Cafe. This was done by a white cis man in his 60s and was reported to the police with Amaterasu going to the hospital for evidence to be taken. You'll be pleased to hear that she finally got a job as a sex worker, with her first customer being a cis Latin lesbian. Amaterasu then went to visit her mum, but sadly her mum got her pronouns wrong and refused to pay for her bottom surgery, so Amaterasu declared herself motherless. Time for another quick detour from the timeline before we reach our thrilling climax. Shortly after Amaterasu made her video trying to recruit Chris Chan to communism, the trolls contacted her father for an interview. The interview was not done with a video call as they weren't very common back then, but the troll was talking to her father on the phone then writing in text what was said, so I guess take what's said with a pinch of salt. In this interview, Amaterasu's father claimed that he did not indecently assault Amaterasu on independence 
Independence Day, but what really happened was that Amaterasu was bullying a young child, so he spanked her. Then Amaterasu's mum told her that she had been abused, which she believed due to her autism. He also said that Amaterasu does not like her new black family and thinks that the transgender thing is just a phase similar to her dressing up as cartoon characters. He said that her mother was a very heavy drinker and thinks that because she drank while pregnant, this is the reason why Amaterasu is the way that she is. He also claimed that Amaterasu's mother would pretend that Amaterasu was more disabled than she was in order to claim more welfare. This being the reason why Amaterasu is two years late leaving high school. He also admitted to hitting Amaterasu's mother while they were having a disagreement over the fake welfare claims. After this phone call, Amaterasu cut all ties with her father due to him talking to her trolls. Later on in life, her father would file a restraining order on Amaterasu due to Amaterasu constantly calling him and making threats. In response to this, Amaterasu posted asking her trolls to harass her father, including his phone number and photograph. Amaterasu's story of what went on with her father on Independence Day has changed a bit over the years with full indecent assault to no indecent assault, but the abuse being in other ways. It's not just her father that has tried to distance themselves from Amaterasu. In a similar vein, some people from her real life have joined in on the trolling of Amaterasu. Dusty, Corin, and her ex-boyfriend Michael have all gotten in on the action. Amaterasu would claim that Michael got so into the trolling that he would walk around with a hammer ready to attack her. Amaterasu would mock this, claiming that the hammer would be too slow for her police baton. She then took threatening photos outside Michael's apartment and posted them to Facebook. Two white people just like walked by me right now. Kind of looked at me a little bit, looked back at him. Obviously, they don't, they don't often see Latinas like, you know, trans Latinas, you know, chilling and taking a vape in the Pearl District slash Snob Hill part of Northwest Portland. It is hella snobby, so it's like, yeah. Okay. Back to the story, Amaterasu visited a holocaust memorial and attempted to poo on it but was stopped by one of her friends. She was now very Amaterasu had a big announcement for the internet. She had now changed her name to Isabel Rosa Ahadjo. Sorry if I mispronounced that. She then set up a Twitter account under this name with a pretty funny tweet thread reading as a Latin ex worker myself this is very true um can you clarify what you're responding to i am a bdsm worker i am made to feel beautiful in this field you haven't yet clarified what you're responding to i am still confused your repeated requests make me feel oppressed and triggers my ptsd Back in Portland, her transition was now becoming a reality. She had been on hormones for six years, but now finally had surgery to remove her testicles. Not a sentence you say every day. She then proceeded to post photos to the internet of this after trolls claimed that she was faking. She wasn't faking. This was a tough time for Isabel. She was homeless, eating out of dumpsters and a worker with all her cash going on surgery and to top it all off she posted that she maced a homeless cis man tough times things started to look up though when she stayed at an emergency woman's shelter and proceeded to get one of the other women kicked out she did eventually get given housing in portland and started a you caring crowdfunding page to help buy things that she needed like furniture tragically amaterasu passed away due to a stroke in a sickening twist of fate it was one of isabel's new alternative personalities named zuchi who found the body somehow there was little time to mourn though as Donald Trump was elected which sparked anger in Portland, a hotbed of far left politics. Around this time Isabel began to fall in with the wrong crowd. Antifa. She began to post about Antifa attacking Trump supporters and harassing Milo Yiannopoulos events. Isabel had a big announcement for the internet. She was now asexual. Not sure how that works for a worker to be honest. Isabel's life was now getting more and more chaotic. 
She was gaining more altars who would all argue with each other. She had fallen deeper down the far left rabbit hole and one of these altars was Jewish, so you can imagine that the other altars didn't like that one very much. Her Facebook posts began to get more extreme with her calling for people to feminists who didn't toe the line when it comes to trans ideology and writing posts that ICE agents should also be Around this time, she began to post more pictures of herself with guns, requesting that K-Farm users come to visit her. In 2017, she finally had surgery to remove her winky and replace it with an inside winky. Of course, she posted photos to the internet as proof. If you cast your mind back all the way to the start, this thing started with her drawing of John McCain. Well, he died and she wrote this post. Rest in piss, you f- US imperialist war criminal, Isabel had a big announcement for the internet. She had now been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Isabel was now firmly embedded in Antifa, going on protests to fight with right-wingers and the police. She posted things like this to the internet. Dear American cis people, I am carrying a bigger knife tomorrow and every day from now on. Your president your mess. I'm pretty sure that most of the right-wing American cis people carry guns, so not a big threat, I guess. She also posted that it is okay to attack cis people if they question a trans person's bathroom choices, stating that bathrooms are designed to clean up easily. There are no cameras. Literally go ape Cheers, beer emoji. She also had a new online title, The Antifa Prime Minister or sometimes the Antifa crime minister. Very clever play on words. Her explicitly stated aim was to accelerate the coming civil war in the USA and to be ready to fight in it once it arrived. She also began to refer to herself and her Antifa teammates as super soldiers, which I found funny for some reason. Super army soldiers. Sadly, even super soldiers have to face the mundane reality of the world sometimes. And she was having problems with her neighbour who she claims was transphobic and that her landlord was apathetic to these problems. In the end, she threatened her neighbour with a baton. In case you're wondering, Australatina was having a bad time at this stage as well, with a small-scale civil war going on. May our hopes and prayers be with them. Isabel was now what she calls an insurrectionary anarchist and longed to be martyred for her cause. She would talk on Twitter about imprisoning people she didn't agree with in her kink dungeon. That's a pretty intimidating threat, to be honest. Her disagreement with her neighbour only got worse, with Isabel claiming to have been trans-bashed by him. So she was looking for a new place to live, but she wanted to stay in Portland so that she could be ready for Antifa work calls and continue her work as an Antifa super soldier. Her words, not mine. She did eventually move away from the apartment, leaving them a review under the name Isabel Antifada. A clear play on words with Antifa and Intifada. The latter being an Arabic word for uprising, commonly used in Palestinian protests. In this review, she urged people not to live in the apartment due to violent incidents with transphobic slash homophobic neighbours. Sadly, stories began to appear on the internet that Isabel had taken her own own life. She had been banned from or deactivated all of her social media at this stage apart from deviant art which she had stopped using so the world mourned. Thankfully this wasn't true but the lack of internet use was probably due to her new super soldier friends not liking media attention. Being the person that she was she couldn't stay offline for long and started to use an app named Mastodon with the username Antifa Highway Patrol. Here she would post about how hot the temperature was inside her barracks. This is what she called it. She would also post photos of toy reindeers dressed up as Antifa. This was the place that she started to post about the nemesis of Antifa everywhere. Andy No. He is a journalist who used to go undercover to Antifa protests and write articles about them. She would write posts asking people to put a bullet in him and she even followed a man in Portland that she thought looked like Andy No posting a photo of him on the bus. Isabel set up a new Twitter account under the name Red Guard in Block. Remember the people that ate people during Chairman Mao's Cultural Revolution? 
they were the Red Guard, and the in-block part refers to Black Block, which is a tactic used by people like Antifa who all dress in black in protests. Remember the Red and Black Cafe? Red's communist, black's militant, I guess is the way to look at it. Anyway, she would post pro-Antifa stuff on this account. Andy then began to investigate Isabel, uncovering her true identity and writing an article about her. In this article, he calls Isabel the leader of Portland Antifa, which honestly I kind of doubt. In this article, he does mention her birth name, but doesn't mention anything else that we've gone over in this video, so I'm not too sure how far he dug into her really. This article does claim that she was running a cash app fundraiser to buy weapons so that her and her super soldier friends could attack a speaking event of a well-known feminist called Posey Parker who was holding a talking event in Oregon. Isabel's post said that she needed $161 for a collapsible baton, bowie knife, black umbrella, eye protection and pouches for her plate carrier. She then said that she could take care of the rest once she has been paid her social security disability payments. The next thing of note is that she was seen at a rally with other members of Antifa who were armed with an AR-15 rifle and sledgehammers. In a disagreement with right-wing protesters she can be seen spraying them with mace while wearing a gas mask. Andy No claims that this was her and honestly judging by the build and way she moves I think it probably is. <laughs> I find this story pretty intriguing and sad to be honest with you. It must be hard to be such a lost soul, stumbling through life, never knowing who you really are. I try to be as unbiased as I can when making these videos, but I really don't like far left communist type politics. And Isabel has been drenched in this politics, so maybe my bias has bled through in this video. And that's fine, I guess. If her and her super soldier friends ever fulfilled their ideological goals, they would eradicate me, the people I love, my culture, culture, country and history from the face of the earth, so if I have been unbiased, I don't really care. And any sympathy I have for her on a human level runs out pretty quick when considering what she has become. This video has been pretty tricky to research, there's a lot of information about her online but it's scattered all over the place. She has had so many different names and popped up on people's radars so many different times then disappeared again, it's hard to piece the timeline together. There are no other videos on YouTube about this topic that I could find at least, apart from one channel. He goes into a lot more detail than I have on this video so check him out if you want to know more. He has a nine or eight part series on this so far and thanks to the channel owner as his videos are very helpful in getting the timeline correct for this video. There are some other little bits and pieces that I couldn't figure out the timeline for so I thought I'd bring up here. Like she got a baseball bat in the colours of the trans flag which she seems to really like. She also got a new bike which again she really likes and called her daughter. Pretty materialistic for a communist. She also has a fondness for tattoos. Enjoy. The events of this video end around 2021 and I've been unable to find out what she is up to these days. But no doubt she is still up to no good with her super soldier friends. I have seen reports that she has now left Buddhism and claims to be a Satanist. I'm unsure if this is true or not but given the upside down cross on her forehead it seems likely. The internet tells me that 1.4% of Americans identify as trans, 1.5% have dissociative identity disorder and 2.2% of people in America have autism. When you add in all of the other stuff like being gay, fibromyalgia and being bipolar, Isabel must be a very rare human so let's hope that she shakes off her super soldier friends and gets her life in order. And that Amaterasu had a good funeral. I've got a brand new still shiny discord so join it. I didn't make it because I'm dumb. This guy made it. This is his Discord and this is his Twitter. He's a really good guy and was one of my early subscribers. He does this as a business, so check him out on Twitter or Discord if you need any help with your stuff on the internet. 
He is a trustworthy guy and you can't put a price on that, so look him up. Also, I've set up a Patreon. Well, I set it up ages ago and just forgot about it, to be honest. But it is now unforgotten and I will be uploading exclusive videos there and to channel members once a month, so check it out. I'll also be posting bonus content for this video and all of my videos onto channel members and Patreon, so sign up on that note shout out to the channel members and patreons they are dirty capitalist pigs probably check out this video about marshall Mathers the fourth he's an interesting guy and bye bye bye